Hello, welcome to Gus McDowell Strategy and Tactics, and thank you to our subscribers. In this series, we play through the 16 operations of the German Grand Campaign in Close Combat 3 The Russian Front. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video. And if you want to show your support with a donation, the links are in the description. In April 1945, the Russians had two fronts east of Berlin and a third poised to the northeast, all ready for the final assault and the end of the Long War. Stalin was increasingly nervous that his Western allies would violate their promise to allow the Russians to capture Berlin. In order to get one last push out of his men, Stalin deliberately erased the boundary lines between Zhukov and Konyev's fronts and set them in a race to capture the city. Zhukov's troops initially fared poorly, and he was forced to use his exploitation reserves to crack the German defensive lines. Konyev's troops did better initially, but soon bogged down in the rubble that was all that was left of Berlin. On April 23, Stalin declared Zhukov's front the winner and drew a new boundary line for the fronts that left the Reichstag in Zhukov's area. On April 30, Russian soldiers raised the hammer and sickle over the German seat of power, and by May 2, all German forces in the city had surrendered. It is day one of five on Operation 16 of 16. Operational Briefing German Gotterdammerung Berlin, April 30, 1945. The fate of Germany is in your hands. Your command is part of the Berlin Garrison, a collection of soldiers and civilians determined to repel the Bolshevist invaders. Your objective is to keep the enemy from crossing the Spree River. Failing that, defend the Ministry of Interior and Reichstag to the last man. There are no reinforcements, so make do with what you have. Surrender is not an option. Only victory is acceptable. Your country is depending on you. You must find a way to win. Battle briefing. Gotterdammerung, the battle for Berlin. The Bolshevists have surrounded our capital. Your objective is to stop them getting across the Spree River. Observers report heavy tanks, supported by infantry, rolling toward the bridge. Keep them from getting across any way you can. Expect an artillery barrage to open the attack. There can be no withdrawal to better positions. Your men must fight to the finish where you deploy them. Your command is attached to the Berlin garrison and consists of whatever men and machines could be gathered together. Position any anti-tank guns carefully because you won't be able to move them. You know the terrain, or what's left of it. The Lerita offers good protection against infantry, but is vulnerable to tanks. The Ministry of Interior offers good fields of fire that cover the bridge. Remember, you cannot retreat. Good luck. We start the operation with the same forces from the last battle. Von McDoll, Command Panzer 5G. Group Leader, Commando Behorden, 1943. Heavy Infantry, Falschemir Gestürm Grenadier, 1943. Heavy Infantry, Sturm Grenadier, 1943. Heavy Infantry, Sturm Grenadier, 1943. Heavy Tank Destroyer, Elephant Sonderkraftfahrzeug 184 by 2. Heavy Tank, Panzer 6B, King Tiger. Medium Tank, Panzer 5G, Panther G. Armored Car, Puma, Sonderkraftfahrzeug 234 by 2. Another armoured car, Puma. Heavy anti-tank gun, 8.8cm Flak 36. Another 8.8cm gun. Medium water, 8cm granite Werfer. Heavy machine gun, Schwerer's Machine Gewehr 2 1943. And a second heavy machine gun. We have 50 requisition points. Let's stock up the infantry on the latest weapons. First, the infantry command team. Command team, Commander Behorden, 1944. Commanders provide leadership. Command staffs add firepower and make commanders more effective. Make sure the commander's radius encompasses the teams you want controlled. Use them to command assaults and anchor defensive positions. The team is equipped with 
three MP40 submachine guns, one assault MG42, one Walther P38 pistol, two Panzerfaust 60, one scoped Mauser, and four hand grenades. Next, the heavy infantry, Falschimäger Sturmgrenadier. Shock troops, Falschimäger Sturmgrenadier, 1944. Use heavy infantry where you need maximum infantry firepower. Position them to lead frontal or flanking assaults on enemy strong points, fight house to house, make counterattacks, or anchor your defense. This team has anti tank capability. The team is equipped with two Sturmgewehr 44. 3 MP40 submachine guns, 2 Panzerfaust 60, 1 Assault MG42, Explosives, 1 FG42, the Falschimäger version of the MG42, 7 hand grenades, and 3 smoke grenades. Finally, the Heavy Infantry Sturmgrenadier 1943. The 1944 variant is equipped with three MP40 submachine guns, one German Pistolet Pulemjot Spagina 41, three Panzerfaust 60, one German Svetta 40, one Assault MG42, one Scoped Mauser, seven hand grenades, and two smoke grenades. The 1945 variant is equipped with more captured Soviet weapons, Panzerfausts, and grenades. Otherwise, at this late stage of the war, there are no major upgrades for vehicles. But we can upgrade the heavy machine guns. Heavy machine gun, Schwerer's Machine and 1944. Position machine guns with a clear field of fire. Use them to suppress the enemy when you attack, defend key positions, or ambush enemy infantry and light vehicles. Move these teams only when necessary. This team has anti-tank capability. The team is equipped with two MP40, one heavy MG42, one Walther P38 pistol, one Mauser rifle, one Panzerfaust 60, and three hand grenades. And that is Kampfgruppe McDoll. Let's examine the terrain and develop a plan. The Spree River divides these two areas of Berlin. Tall buildings to the south overlook the bridge and open areas on the other side of the river. The map is rotated 90 degrees and north is to the right side of the map as indicated. I've marked five areas. Number one, the buildings on the near bank of the Spree River. From left to right, the Schliefenhofer, the Ministry of Interior, and the road to the Reichstag some 600 metres away off the map. These three and four storey brick and concrete buildings offer excellent observation over the bridge and far bank of the river, as well as cover and concealment for infantry. The streets provide natural fire lanes for tanks. Number two, the von Moltke Bridge over the Spree River, the Moltkebrücke. This is the only crossing point in this sector, and anything crossing is vulnerable to observation and fire. 
Number three, the buildings west of Alt Moabit. The road is partially destroyed and the buildings are shelled and burned ruins. They provide some cover from direct fire, but with no roofs, no cover from indirect fire. Between the buildings and the river is an open square with no cover or concealment. In happier times, this would have been a lovely place for a stroll. Number four, the Laoto Railway Workshop Building. This concrete building offers cover and concealment to infantry and allows observation of the surrounding area. And number five, the open area towards Invalidenstrasse. The area is crossed by a railway track with a small platform station. A few ruined buildings offer some concealment for infantry, but otherwise the area is flat and open. Good for tanks, but vulnerable to anti-tank fire. Key terrain includes the Schlieffenhofer and the Ministry of Interior buildings, which offer command of the ground as well as cover and concealment. Also, the Lerta, which offers cover and concealment to infantry. The von Moltke Bridge is decisive terrain. Control of the bridge will either allow or prevent the Soviet advance across the Spree River. The obvious avenue of approach is across the open terrain and across the bridge. However, the Soviets could also advance to the bridge through the ruined buildings to the north or from behind the Lerta workshop building. The briefing warned us of heavy tanks, supported by infantry and an artillery barrage to open the attack. The artillery barrage could target the Schlieffenhofer and the Ministry of Interior buildings as obvious defensive positions for the Germans. The barrage would most likely use high explosive to blast the buildings and could also use smoke to blind German observation. Soviet infantry could stage from the ruins near the Alt Moabit to secure the ruined buildings and later on the far side of the riverbank. With the far side secured, Soviet armour could then drive straight for the bridge using firepower to suppress any German defenders and take the near side of the bridge to allow Soviet infantry to cross and take the subsequent objective. With the von Moltke bridge in Soviet hands, nothing can stop the Soviet advance into Berlin. One option for the Germans is to establish a line of resistance or Widerstandslinie on the near bank of the Spree River. German forces would remain south of the river. The infantry, heavy machine gun and anti-tank guns would set up firing positions in the multi-storey buildings overlooking the bridge. And the tanks would use the streets as fire lanes. The Puma armoured cars would remain in reserve, ready to dash across the bridge and counterattack Soviet infantry as they flee. All units would target the open ground as an engagement area immediately in front of the Moltke Bridge. Any tanks or infantry entering this area would be met with a barrage of fire from multiple directions. This plan would concentrate firepower at a decisive point in the battle space and dominate the decisive terrain. However, the defensive locations are obvious and we were warned they would likely be targeted by heavy Soviet artillery. This could lead to unacceptable casualties before the Soviet tanks even appear. Another option for the Germans is to conduct a local counterattack to throw the Soviets off balance and buy time while they regroup. To deceive the enemy, achieve surprise and avoid the artillery barrage, the Germans would place all their forces forward on the north side of the river rather than the expected south. The infantry, heavy machine guns and armoured cars would form a strong point at the Lerta, remaining concealed as long as possible to ambush the Soviet advance in the flank. The panzers and anti-tank guns would form a special battle group, taking up concealed positions west of Alt Moabit, targeting the same engagement area but from a flank. At the right moment, the punces would then advance to a forming up point near the Moltke Bridge and use their firepower and mobility to clear remaining Soviet forces from the area, with supporting fire from the strong point. This plan would deceive the enemy, achieve surprise, put flanking rather than frontal fire on heavy Soviet tanks, and retake ground with a local counterattack. Delaying actions seek to deceive the enemy as to German strength dispositions and intentions. These measures are accomplished by rearguards, special battle groups and strong points, all of which are characterised by high automatic firepower, mobility and economy in numerical strength. Since the fighting on the Vistula, von McDoll had avoided getting his command involved in further fighting in a war already lost. On the long march west, through freezing snows, the Kampfgruppe had stumbled on a group of the party's special political troops, harassing civilian refugees at a roadblock. No sooner had von McDoll ducked his head into the turret to get the radio operator to raise headquarters than shots rang out. 
Alarmed, he looked out to see the refugees hurrying past the roadblock to safety. The political troops lay motionless in the reddening snow. His battle-hardened soldiers calmly marched on, rifles slung, each looking him in the eyes as they passed. No words were exchanged. None were needed. Closer to Berlin, wounded former members of the Kampfgruppe got word to him of a nearby veterans' hospital and orphanage under threat from the Soviet advance, and needing urgent evacuation to the West. First, he would need to delay the entire Soviet advance. At Berlin Garrison headquarters, he pretended to listen to a high-ranking party official's talk of defending to the last man, no surrender, final victory and so on. Until the official gave him the all-important written document authorising his movement within Berlin. Then he turned on his heels and left, ignoring the party official's parting salute. I have now moved my troops into position and will execute the plan in real time. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the various courses of action and if you've identified a viable alternative. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe for more great strategy and tactics content. And so we begin. Achtung Panzer, Soviet T-34 near Alt Moabit. The Soviet heavy artillery barrage begins. Alt Richter and Kleese move their squads into position. Shells land in the Ministry of Interior building. The infantry squads go to ground in the Lerta. Ambush set. The anti-tank force lurks in ambush positions amongst the ruined buildings. No sign of the Russians.
the final bombardment. More Soviet armour. The barrage is over. A Soviet attack imminent. No casualties amongst the anti-tank group. Another T-34, briefly glimpsed near Invalidenstrasse. The ambush group are ready. But where are the Soviets? SU-152 crossing the tracks. Russian infantry advancing towards the buildings. Zoltman's Panther advances to get a better shot. The T-34 also appears. The Granatwerfer opens a fire mission amidst the infantry. Zeltman targets the T-34 from the flank, as does the King Tiger from the front. The T-34 is immobilised. But its turret has swung towards Zeltmann, who makes a quick retreat to cover. Soviet casualties from the Granatwerfer. The 8.8cm gun crew engaged the Russian infantry with grenades and rifles.
the T-34 gets off a shot against the Panther, hits but without damage. Another Soviet tank. No action at the Lerta. Under machine gun fire from the King Tiger, the remaining Soviet infantry surrender. More Soviet infantry advancing across open ground. A granite Werfer target. The King Tiger advances cautiously to engage the T-34. Obergefighter Gemma fears immobilization more than destruction. Противник предложил прекращение огня. The King Tiger and Panther advance together to give the T-34 a targeting dilemma. Zeltmann scores the winning hit with a flanking shot destroying the T-34. Both panzers withdraw to cover. Infantry at the latter briefly scan outside. Only to glimpse an advancing SU-152. The 
the King Tiger and Elephant move up to firing positions. The Russians request a truce, but this would merely let them choose when to attack next. Von McDoll wants to remove this choice to buy time to properly evacuate the hospital. More Soviet infantry. McDoll moves forward. A T-34 near the latter. The SU-152 disappears around the corner of the latter. And is damaged by a Panzerfaust in the side. The T-34 flame remains behind cover. Ultra squad is under fire and withdraws to better cover. The fire is coming from a T-70 light tank. Von McDoll's Panther engages Russian recon infantry moving through the ruins. So far, the Soviet advance has been cautious rather than decisive. Meaning, it can be defeated in detail, one squad at a time. <laughs> Only one crewman of the SU-152 remains. <laughs> Meters from a platoon of German infantry veterans. He wisely surrenders. <laughs> Rounds from the Granatwerfer cause further Russian infantry casualties. T-70 is moving towards Altmo Abbott. But is knocked out by Zeltman's Panther. The Russian recon team is also destroyed. The Panthers now advance to join the King Tiger and Elephant. We are munition. The Soviets did not conduct a headlong assault into the engagement area as predicted, so the Kampf group will need to bring the fight to them. So far, the Soviets have lost a T-34, a T-70, and an Su-152.
German infantry peer out again, looking for targets. Zeltmann's Panther moves up into the line. Stellungswechsel ausgeführt. The King Tiger and Panther fire on and damage the Russian 120mm mortar. The Elephant calmly knocks out the T-34 flame tank. McDowell moves his Panther up to the firing line. The tank crew abandon the T-34 and run away. The mortar crew are all killed, injured or suppressed. More Russian infantry casualties. The Panzer counterattack now assaults Ford. The destruction of the Soviet assault force will delay their advance by a day, enabling a proper evacuation of the people in the hospital to the west. The Russian mortar crewman flees. Achtung Panzer! An SU-85. King Tiger fires first and destroys the SU-85, which starts to burn. Major victory! What a great way to end the campaign! The battle ended because the Russians fled the battlefield. The Germans gained control of the area and the operation is over. The operation ended because the Russians routed. You, Herr von Mikdahl, gained one campaign point. All of your training is beginning to pay off. And just in time. For the Germans, it was another bloodless battle with no losses in men or equipment. 
Russian losses were 17 killed, 13 wounded, 2 prisoners, 4 armoured vehicles destroyed and 1 gun captured, the 120mm mortar. Let's examine the Kampf Group. Unterfeldwebel Ollerich, in The Elephant, is awarded the War Merit Badge, his fifth such award. Obergefreiter von Schmeling and Gefreiter Eberhardt, in The King Tiger, are both awarded the Iron Cross Second Class. Unterfeldwebel Brin, in Zeltmann's Panther, is also awarded the Iron Cross Second Class. And Gefreiter Kretz is awarded the Iron Cross First Class. I will go through again for anyone interested in the final medal tally for the campaign. Unterfeldwebel Ollerich in The Elephant and Unterhofizier Klumper in The Elephant share credit for a tank kill, the T-34 Flame. Obergefreiter von Schmeling and Gefreiter Eberhardt in The King Tiger share credit for another tank kill, the Su-85. Unterfeldwebel Brin and Gefreiter Kretz in Zeltmann's Panther are each credited with a tank kill, the T-34 and the T-70. The captured Su-152 and 120mm mortar are not credited. Some improvements in morale, leadership and experience across the Kampf Group. Thankfully, no injuries or deaths. A quick review of the History tab. Who was there from the beginning and who joined later? Fifteen members survive from Barbarossa to the last battle of the war. They form the core group of the Kampf Group's post-war veterans association. The operation is a minor victory. The campaign is a decisive victory for the Kampf Group, less so for the Germans overall. The Kampf Group's losses throughout the war are 25 killed, 32 wounded, 1 prisoner, 3 tanks destroyed, 5 tanks damaged, and 1 gun lost. Russian losses throughout the war are 308 killed, 
267 wounded, 87 prisoners, 91 tanks destroyed, 16 tanks captured, 8 guns destroyed, and 2 guns captured. And Von McDoll finishes the war as a major. So, what did we learn? In this battle, German defensive doctrine worked as advertised. In the delaying action, the Kampfgruppe deceived the Soviets as to their strength, with most of the Kampfgruppe hidden throughout the battle. The Kampfgruppe deceived the Soviets as to their dispositions, starting on the far bank of the Spree River and avoiding the artillery barrage. And the Kampfgruppe deceived the Soviets as to their intentions, counterattacking rather than defending in place on the near bank. The infantry held a strong point, while the Panzers formed a special battle group, and their counterattack demonstrated firepower, mobility, and economy in numerical strength. Which neatly fits with the overall theme of this series, exploring what happens when you play Close Combat 3 using historical German World War II doctrine and company-level tactics. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and donate. And stay tuned for the next episode.